Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. Today, we have a very wonderful and well-groomed guest, Brian Crawford, who is going to be talking to us a bit about an herb that's one of my favorites called Shichangpu in Chinese. And the Latin, if you can say that for us, Brian. Yeah, it's uh, Acorus tataranoei. This is in a category of herbs that we we like to say open the orifices and dissolve phlegm or transform phlegm. That sounds really so, gross. What does that mean? It's uh, What this means is that if you've ever been in a place where you're a little, maybe hungover is the right word, um, but feeling cloudy-minded uh, or like you can't think very clearly and there's a little bit of fog in front of your brain and you're moving slowly, you can't make decisions very well. When you try to decide on something, your your anxiety kicks in and second guesses you on everything you do. Um, herbs that open the orifices are sort of like taking a breath of fresh air and going, and then you go, oh, I can see clearly now. Um, and then, you know, things that dissolve phlegm, these are for uh, obvious manifestations of phlegm and mucus. So people who are coughing up phlegm, people who uh, are constantly feeling the presence of a thick coating in their mouth, uh, people who move slowly and retain a lot of extra water or you know pack on the weight really easily. Uh, these people all have phlegmatic constitutions. Okay, so the phlegmatic constitution, that's something that reminds me of uh, like medieval medicine. You've got a big fat guy, he's phlegmatic, and someone sure. who's a little bit fiery is, what is that, sanguine, I think? Yeah, yeah, and then um, bilious would be someone who's, who's kind of angry. Okay. Uh, and then there's, the, what's the other one? It's like splenic, is that the other one? Yeah, or? that's the other one, yeah. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, you know, this, this could be used for a couple of those presentations. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if this is part of traditional medieval medicine or not, but, um, yeah, different ways of looking at the body preclude us to all kinds of different uses for these herbs. And this was, you know, really just, um, sort of in the rubbish bin of historic quackery. But now that we're looking at the gut brain axis, we're finding these kind of overlaps between bacteria that have these biofilms that are very slimy and phlegmatic and uh, associations between those and obesity, for instance, or sure. sodium potassium pumps that are shutting down. And then somebody who's going to be, you know, a little more watery or phlegmatic is, you know, they used to say back in the day. And it's interesting because just the way our gut bacteria is tipping and the effect of our immune systems can literally shape our body. Yeah. Yeah. So we look at, you know, the, the modern diet that most people are eating, um, not just in America anymore, but in pretty much every industrialized nation these days is, you know, something that contributes to a lot of that. And that's why we see a lot of rising rates of obesity, um, and the, associated comorbidities that come along with that blood sugar dysregulation cardiovascular issues dementia etc um it we don't move as much as we used to we don't walk you know 10 to 20 to 40 thousand steps a day most of us aren't working physical labor intensive jobs anymore and the food that we're eating is all this refined um pre-packaged pre-cooked stuff that is um reduced in its uh, micronutrient profile. And so what we're getting is just tons and tons of grease and sugar. And this stuff just, it, you know, it feeds those yeasts and the bacteria that, prom that make us secrete more uh, hormones to promote weight gain. Um, it uh, is a lot more sugar than we need con considering and a lot more fat than we need considering our levels of activity. And so it transforms our bodies into this state where we're both gaining weight constantly and then having a more difficult time losing it. How many of your patients, I'm just curious, if you were to give a rough estimate, in, um, you know, in Oregon, are overweight and have sleep apnea or snore? Easily 50%, if Easily. not more. Easily. Yeah. Um, you know, the, in traditional Chinese medicine, we look at climate as a major influence of 
of uh, what kinds of health conditions are affecting a population of people. And I don't know to what degree the, the modern research has caught up with this yet, but it is definitely the case as I've traveled around the United States and around the world that, you know, you see that people in cold, wet areas, such as Oregon, where I am, uh, we, we tend to gain weight more easily than other places. And maybe that's because we stay inside more. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't get outside as much. But I think also, um, you know, I remember many times going outside uh, as a child running around without shoes on in the rain in the middle of winter, ignoring the climate factors and then getting sick the next day. Mm -hmm. um, and those, Ill, you know, when people catch colds in some places, they get a dry cough. Uh, I think in my practice here in Oregon, I've, it, you know, I've been in practice for almost 10 years. I think I've probably seen two cases of dry cough in my, in my career. Um, From Eastern is, Oregon? Yeah, they were probably, they caught it in Eastern Oregon and then came back here. And uh, phlegm is, is universal here. You know, you, you, um, it's a protective function. Our body creates mucus in order to protect uh, delicate tissues. Mm -hmm. But um, many things cause us to overproduce that. And, it, it, you know, the therapies uh, of these plants like Changpu, uh, like Acarus, the, you know, it's about uh, reducing the amount of that mucus that's blocking you from being able to breathe, that's blocking you from being able to think, that's blocking you from being able to digest your food. Along the lines of running around barefoot in the rain in Oregon as a kid, I used to do that in Coos Bay. And yeah. I, would, I was allergic to milk when I was on the coast. But when I went to Klamath Falls or California to visit my dad, for the summers, I was not allergic to milk anymore. So it was interesting. I had this conditional milk allergy that was climate-based. And of course, at the time, you know, we would ask the allergists and they had no idea, but now there's certainly a much deeper understanding of the role that climate can play on the bacteria that are about and, you know, taking these sort of um, dairy-based foods will cause more of a mucosal effect in the body. Mm -hmm. And then that harbors certain types of life and whether, maybe if you're in a desert, that's really ideal for you. But if you're in a coastal region, where it's much damper and colder, that's not quite so ideal. What are the general bits of dietary advice that you give people? Um, avoiding dairy is a big one. Uh, mm -hmm. Eating a lot of warm foods. You know, um, the the United States is on kind of a smoothie craze. I think it's been slowly developing since the '70s, and people got blenders everywhere. But the um, you know, people are throwing tons of raw kale and milk and uh, coconut oil and chia seeds into a blender and, and you know, turning it into this sludge. And maybe you can make it taste good. And in small amounts, it's, it's probably a good way to get a lot of vegetable matter in. But um, that stuff is hard to digest. And the, the rate at which people consume it uh, contributes to a traditional Chinese method of food stagnation or view of that where, you know, you, you eat a lot of stuff really quick. Uh, if, if you were going to take three pounds of kale and chew it up and eat it, um, it would take you a long time. If you have your blender do it in 30 seconds and then you drink the whole thing in another 30 seconds, that's, that's rough on your digestive system. So eating food more slowly is, is one thing I suggest to people, especially if you're going to be having smoothies. Um, Limiting sugar, especially refined sugar intake, uh, limiting alcohol, uh, and then grains are a category of food that cause people to retain a lot of water. Uh, from a traditional Chinese medicine perspective, we, you know, grains are foods that encourage the body to build flesh. And we usually think of protein as being the, in that category, and that's true, but uh, what we don't think about is that when we want to feed livestock, when we want our livestock to grow really large, we don't feed them meat. We feed them a lot of plant matter. We feed mm -hmm. them a lot of grain in particular. And that the sweet flavor of grain as well as the carbohydrate level of grain and then, you know, the way that that, that grain interacts with uh, the microbiota of whatever organism is eating it um, triggers the release of insulin and insulin-like growth factor. 
Mm-hmm. And we know that that causes people to pack on the pounds very quickly. Uh, it also contributes to mucus and biofilms. Just curious, because I've seen some of your older pictures. There was a time in your life where you were much heavier than you are now. Is that correct, or was it just camera angle? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, as a teenager, I was morbidly obese. Uh, and by the time I was 21, I weighed 365 pounds. And so um, through you know, a lot of diet, a lot of exercise, uh, a lot of change in the way that I had a relationship with food, I was able to shed much of that. And I'm, I'm now at a, a fairly healthy weight. Um, having kids in the last couple of years has reduced the amount of time I have for exercise and proper food prep. But um, yeah, changing, changing the relationship I had with food was key to that. At the time when you were much heavier, did you have signs and symptoms that would overlap with this concept of phlegm? Sure. Yeah. Um, I was very anxious. Uh, Mm -hmm. I had a difficult time thinking clearly. Um, I moved very slowly all the time. Um, And that's not just from being heavy and being unable to run very fast. It was just a way of life. You know, people would ask me to do something and I'd take two hours to do a job that should have taken 15 minutes. Uh, and then, you know, just the obvious presence of mucus, constant runny nose, post-nasal drip, uh, allergies to, uh, in every season to cats and pollens and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And you're probably getting quite a bit of that in the Willamette Valley blowing around. Oh, it's, it, it's terrible. Uh, you can see the pollen on your car in the morning in the springtime. So just as uh, you mentioned diet and exercise, was it one method uh, that seemed to work better for you than others, or was it just kind of chipping at it from a number of different angles? It was before I studied Chinese medicine, so I didn't really understand the nature of flavors of food and how that affected the body. Mm -hmm. Um, But I... um, in hindsight, it, I did follow those principles a little bit subconsciously. Mainly what I did was uh, keeping a journal, uh, a diary of everything that I put in my mouth. So if I had a cup of tea, it went on there. If I had a quesadilla, it went on there. And uh, I would tally up the number of calories that I had every day and had a certain number under which I required myself to stay. And then I just exercised as I, as I was able to. You know, I'd go to the gym and run on the elliptical for half an hour and lift some weights. And, um, that got really boring very quickly. So eventually it was, um, taking up martial arts that Mm -hmm. allowed me to continue, uh, exercising something that was fun. You mainly practiced Aikido, is that right? Mainly Aikido. Um, I've also done quite a bit of Taiji, Mm -hmm. uh, and in, as a child, I did some So as you were losing weight, what kind of systemic effects did you feel on the body? You mentioned while you were heavier that you're kind of in terms of your motivation and just kind of metabolism of life was quite a bit slower. How did that change as you began losing weight? Um, I found a greater, I found that I was much more invested in living uh, rather than just, um, Not that I was suicidal to begin with, Mm -hmm. although, you know, depression is one thing that comes along with obesity for a lot of people. And I was certainly predisposed to that. But um, I was, while some people would say I was easygoing, I would just say that I was much more lazy and uh, lackadaisical um, Mm -hmm. and not in a happy way, not in a, well, you know, hey, this is what today's going to bring. Let's see how it goes kind of a sense, uh, maybe on my good days. But uh, most of the time it was sort of like a, a, f- uh, um, a kind of feudalism uh, or futility uh, that there was no, no point in putting forth effort because it wasn't really going to get me anywhere that was, that was fun. And yeah. Excellent. So I'm just wanting to touch on these because as we look into the pharmacology as we look into the traditional indications of herbs which are good for phlegm like um, Fu. it's interesting to explore within your personal life narrative how this has affected you and then Hmm. really look at kind of the how and why and what we can learn 
for helping not only ourselves but also you know other people if we have patients or friends and family. So can you tell me a little bit about Shichang Pu from a traditional standpoint? Sure. So it's uh, its nature is warm and it's spicy. It's acrid. Uh, it's pungent. So it has a it has a lifting and releasing quality. Uh, and then uh, it's traditionally said to mostly enter the heart and lung, um, but also somewhat the stomach, the liver, the spleen, uh, the other organs that can be encumbered by phlegm. That's really interesting because a lot of times high quality Shichang Pu in China is growing near waterfalls. So these places that are just intensely moldy and wet and this yeah. herb itself, of course, it has to survive in these kind of conditions, these very wet conditions. So then it's drying and it's interesting, you know, water is kind of descending and then this has an ascending nature mm -hmm. just to, I guess, counter it. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, the, these plants evolve to survive and thrive in specific kind of conditions. And I, in my little professor mind, I like to think that's how traditional cultures identified what kinds of things they would be useful for treating when, when placed in a human body. Mm -hmm. So this is going up and it's mainly affecting the heart and lungs, secondarily a little bit of the spleen digestive organs, and you mentioned it also hits the liver. Mm -hmm. So it's hitting yeah. all three all three major areas of the body, the upper, middle, and lower jaw. Yes, um, yeah, that's right. It's it's. I think it's more traditionally used as mostly a an herb for the upper part of the body, mm -hmm. uh, especially the brain. Mm -hmm. But um, it, you know, the brain is considered an extraordinary organ in Chinese medicine. It it we don't have herbs that. Um, that are specific to the brain. We have herbs that are for the head. We have herbs that are for phlegm, which affects the brain. We have herbs that are for um, uh, uh, syndromes that we now attribute to brain issues. Um, but the brain is sort of a reflection of the organs uh, of the body and their their different functional aspects. Mm -hmm. So um, this one is it can be used for, for phlegm in the lower part of the body. Uh, it can also be used for, for phlegm in the liver, or um, as we see it, we call it dampness usually, which uh, causes a constriction of blood flow through the liver, uh, reduces the liver's ability to detoxify the blood and direct the blood around the body. Hmm. So from a modern standpoint, what are some of the attributes which have been found in laboratory tests for Shichang Pu? Uh, mainly what's been studied about it is, is its effect on mental emotional disorders. And so um, they, they've actually identified a specific, uh, an, uh, a volatile oil from this plant called an acerone. And I, um, you know, they've, they've got a lot of literature out there now on how acerone affects mental emotional conditions like anxiety and depression. Um, uh, in fact, one study, they subjected mice to chemically induced stress from giving them corticosterone injections, and that puts them in a state of severe anxiety. And it's sort of like if you're, if you've had five bad nights of sleep in a row and you're trying to leave the house really early in the morning and you can't find your keys and your children are screaming and you realize that your shirt's on inside out and you spilled coffee on it, uh, and you've had 10 cups of coffee and you're jittery and your attention is spread in all directions at once, that's what these mice are like. And so they give them some acerone and they find that the mice are able to suddenly focus and accomplish simple tasks, uh, like finding holes in a wall that they can creep through. And so, um, you know, used in humans, it has a similar effect. Uh, when we're overwhelmed, when we're completely wiped out, and when we can't think straight, uh, we've probably been eating bad foods for a while, um, comfort foods. Uh, this herb has the ability to do that in our, in our mind. And is it working directly on the brain, or is it working by way of the gut-brain axis or inflammation? Do you know if it's more direct or indirect or both? It's both. Uh, it's it's working on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So, um, you know, people are looking at that all the time uh, in terms of what they call functional medicine. Uh, and oftentimes that 
that particular bent on things looks exclusively at the adrenal glands and how uh, they're responding to other areas of the body's stress. Um, the acerone seems to work mostly on uh, the secretion of uh, things like nerve growth factor and um, brain-derived neurotrophin factor. And these are, these are chemicals that are uh, mostly existing in the synaptic junctions in our brain. So um, they're, they're probably also in the gut. Uh, we know we have a lot of uh, neurotransmitter activity there. Um, but as far as I understand it, what, mostly this has been studied directly in the brain. Interesting. So these herbs for phlegm and the concept of phlegm blocking the orifices, which people have experienced as you know, high anxiety and an inability to think straight, this is something that you also experienced, I've experienced, I think most of us have. You know, maybe you just eat a bad burrito or something and you can't <laughs> think as well as you might. Or you've been on a diet for years that isn't, that isn't great. So, you know, whether that's creating some kind of inflammatory biofilm or whether it's just indirectly over time done some neural decay or damage, what it sounds like is this volatile oil inside of Shichangpu has the ability to repair or ameliorate this. That's right. And I, I think a key word in that is volatile. You know, this is an herb that's traditionally not cooked for a long period of time when it's prepared. Um, this is something that if this herb has been stored for a long time and it's, it's gone stale, uh, it, it doesn't work as well as something that's fresh. And, um, you know, it, it, it's a, uh, herbs that are traditionally used in the upper part of the body, like we talked about for this one, have a light quality. And they oftentimes need to be, um, you're, you're trying to preserve those volatile oils because they are light, they are airy, and they will evaporate if, um, or, or go stale if, uh, if the herb is not a good quality product. Mm. What else is this herb able to help with from a modern standpoint? Um, you know, biofilms, you've, you've mentioned that word a few times. This is a great one for that. Um, biofilms are this secretion of a, a mucosal layer that a lot of, uh, it, it's part of the human body's natural mechanism of protecting delicate tissues, the lining of the stomach, the lining of our sinuses. Um, but it's also something that is created by, uh, microbiota, by different bacteria, different, uh, microorganisms to protect themselves. And so in these people who have been, you know, we've talked about these phlegmatic people like myself, uh, this, this herb is really good at, um, breaking those biofilms down and bringing the microbiota of the body back into balance that way. So you can, you can, you know, um, one thing that I treat a lot of is Lyme disease and, uh, Lyme is traditionally very resistant to antibiotics. Uh, you can give them for a prolonged period of time and keep that bacteria, that spirochete population down but for many of my patients, you know, they've taken doxycycline for three years or more and they feel great while they're taking it. And then as soon as they stop taking it, um, all their symptoms come back. And that's because this bacteria uh, secretes, it creates, a, it's, um, the, the spirochetes communicate with each other. And so they, they secrete uh, the same kind of intercellular transmitters that our own cells secrete. And so when they detect the presence of an antibacterial substance, something that causes them to uh, not be able to reproduce properly or something that directly lyses the cell wall and causes them to break apart, they start secreting chemicals that warn their alarm signals, that, that warn the other cells or the other bacteria to go into a cystic state. So they secrete a hard um, form of a mucosal layer, a hard biofilm around themselves, and that protects them from the antibiotic. And herbs like Changpu, uh, like Acris, these can bust through that. That's part of what that, you know, um, expansive action that they have is. Uh, the phlegm transforming is that they get in there and it's sort of like, um, uh, if you ever watched Mr. Wizard as a kid, he does that experiment with the, the soap film on top of a, a layer of water. And then you, you, you drop something into that and it causes that, um, that soap film to just sort of 
bust apart and all of a sudden you can stick your your hand down into the water and it gets wet whereas before you you'd stick it in there and it would and it would come out with the film on it but no no water on your hand uh changpu does that to to mucus wow so is shi changpu something that people would take by themselves like if you suspect that you may be a little bit overweight or that you may have some lingering pathogen should you just eat this stuff like cheerios <laughs> um, if it was available as a snack bag, people probably would try it, but I don't recommend doing that. Um, this is always used in formulas. So uh, there, it's, it's commonly paired with another uh, herb called yuanzhi, which is um, it, uh, something else that helps improve memory and mental function. Uh, it's commonly used, and that combination, you will see Chinese medicine students using it all the time on finals day or test day. Uh, it's also commonly paired with digestive aid herbs. So other herbs that have aromatic qualities, other herbs that transform phlegm, other herbs that um, increase the secretion of stomach acid and uh, bile and pancreatic enzymes and all those digestive juices that help us keep our microflora in our gut in a healthy state and help us break down our food uh, and digest it properly. Uh, it is also, and this is not one of its main uses, but this herb, a fun anecdote is that this herb can be used a lot for um, lung conditions. So when you've got, you know, a real phlegmy cough. Um, I, in fact, there was one time my mom had bronchitis and she uh, she was just coughing, hocking up loogies like crazy. I gave her a, a kind of a classic Chinese herbal formula for that. Um, she got some improvement, but she still had this sticky stuff that kept coming up with every cough. We added a little Shichang Pu to that formula and it, it really, really helped her a lot, really improved that. That's great. So if people are taking Shichang Pu, you mentioned that it's always used in a formula and used with other herbs. Are the other herbs used just because they have a similar function or are they also used to take away maybe a potential side effect? So. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. The The poetry of Chinese herbal formulas is often about balance. Uh, a formula will have a direction, and like any strong medicine, they can be used properly and they can also be used improperly. And if, you know, this is a very drying herb. So if uh, somebody doesn't have a lot of phlegm, this herb could potentially not be good for them. Um, and one of the things about drying formulas is that it's possible to overuse them. So this herb is usually combined with, um, with herbs that will uh, have a mild moistening effect, but they'll promote the creation of healthy moisture, of healthy water in the body, not, um, not you know, thick, sludgy, gross, phlegmy water. Okay. Is there anything else that Shi Chang Pu has been found to be good for? I've seen some studies on neurogenesis, but I think it may be in line with the first aspect you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the ones that I've seen have that action. Uh, they, they, in terms of neurogenesis, they're mostly working on anxiety and depression, but, um, the traditional uses of this, uh, do include things like dementia, um, and stroke and some cardiovascular diseases. And in the modern research world, I think a lot more work is required to, to verify those claims from a traditional standpoint. But we still use it that way, and we see good results from doing so. So there's obviously some benefit there. Uh, neurogenesis, you know, like you said, um, the ability to grow new nerve connections in the brain. Uh, neuroplasticity has a lot of potential effects in terms of pain management, in terms of uh, stroke rehabilitation, when we look at arthritis, particularly osteoarthritis and related um, diseases, there's an impact of the immune system on pain signaling. Mm -hmm. Does Shi Chang Pu have an effect on the immune system? Yeah. I mean, you look at its classical use in, in terms of uh, all kinds of autoimmune conditions, conditions we now call autoimmune. The uh, traditional Chinese medicine doesn't use that term. Um, but when the body's encumbered by phlegm, um, and dampness, uh, you know, these things, that stuff can get lodged in the joints too. And uh, being able to clear that out, uh, is, you know, means you have less pain. Mm. 
what are the effects of using these kind of um, phlegm herbs that transform phlegm around the heart? What have you found their effects on your patients, not only in terms of visible symptoms, but on their labs, maybe cholesterol or some of these other uh, maybe more, I don't want to say tangible, but more objective findings? Uh, it, you often see the triglyceride levels come down. So, you know, that's a form of fat that's stored in the blood and uh, using this herb uh, in, the, in the context of the proper formula. Again, we want to stress that this is not something that's to be taken just on its own. You don't want to go out and, and just start chewing on it. But, um, yeah, it, it can really help with uh, cholesterol balance. Excellent. And cholesterol itself, I've just been looking into this recently it seems it can contribute to its own form of pain in the body. So some of the invisible forms of pain are at least linked with higher cholesterol. Like, I'm not um, familiar with that. Yeah, like um, after a hysterectomy, some women will get higher cholesterol because of the estrogens being lower. And then that particular spike in cholesterol is linked with its own pain signaling. So wow. it kind of, you know, makes sense if, uh, of course, when we talk about something like phlegm in Chinese medicine, it's a very much a big picture concept, but then looking at where it may link up via the pharmacology, via, you know, your clinical findings with triglycerides, with cholesterol, with these biofilms, it helps to draw, you know, it helps to kind of translate this ancient picture into something that's much more user-friendly in a modern context. So that's always something that's been fascinating to me is because I'll say to somebody who really may need herbs in a very bad way, hey, this is going to transform phlegm. And they say, what does this mean? What do you hope to accomplish? This is going to be sure. something very involved. What are we looking at here? So then that leads me to ask the question, okay, what are these traditional signs and symptoms of phlegm? How does it influence you know, perhaps biofilms, perhaps the immune system, you know, neurogenesis. It's interesting. I, before I had seen this, um, this research that you're talking about, I really took it more as like uh, something indirect or metaphorical, but it's really fascinating how directly the effects are on the body from both a traditional and modern context. Yeah, and I think being able to put that into language that our patients can understand is really key to to helping them take charge of their own health and uh, know what's going to work for them and what isn't. Well, thank you so much for helping us to bridge this. I've had some questions, and I know when it comes to, you know, Lyme and biofilms and this kind of weird diseases, as they say, for weird diseases, treat phlegm. I, naughty I, conditions. Right, yeah. naughty conditions treat phlegm. So I, I really appreciate your insight with this. Thanks for having me on, Andrew. Okay. Well, I hope you'll come back on soon so, you know, we can have great content and I don't have to do as much work. <laughs> Always happy to help. <laughs> All right. Talk to you later. All right. See you soon. Bye-bye. I used to carry every herbal formula I could get my hands on. You can just imagine how this clogged up shelf space and mental space, plus it gave me a lot to dust every week. We looked at our most effective products, our automatic top sellers, and found that they coincided with the most popular and effective herbal products in East Asia. We decided to focus on the winners and then make them even better. Our research team in Chengdu upgraded these formulas using the highest quality herbs on the planet and rigorously testing them at pharmaceutical standard for quality and safety. You'll want to get your hands on this, and you'll get your supplies at botanicalbiohacking.com. Thanks for listening to the Botanical Biohacking Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Miles.